and I'm privileged to be here. I've been to the IRCP eight times. Um, I've been scheduled to speak nine times and managed to get sick last time. And I've been involved for about 10 years. And um, this is a little bit different to what other people have said because what's impressive about this conference compared to where we started was that people are actually reporting on real programs now. It was all talk at the start. We all talked to each other and said, wouldn't that be a wonderful idea? So we've made a lot of progress, but we haven't necessarily put it into the big picture because community paramedicine is only part of paramedicine. It's not the be all and end all, and there's a whole lot of other things going on, but I think community paramedicine is actually influencing what's happening in paramedicine generally because after all, we're dealing with the same patients. Strangely enough, they don't segment, um, go one way or the other. They, they actually are the same people. So we will influence what happens in the mainstream, if you like, of paramedicine. And what I'm going to do is actually look at the past, the present and the future of paramedicine in terms of models. Now this might be a little bit theoretical. I'll, please excuse me for that. But I'm here because I can speak about the past because I'm old enough to remember it. And I've experienced it. And I'm still here and I'm still looking to the future. So I'll say that I'm qualified to talk about this. And in fact, a lot of the actual things I've got written on the screen here have come directly from my PhD, which is nearly 15 years ago, which is the most frustrating part because I wanted the change to happen then, not now. But we are getting there. Um, I'd also like to thank the Australian New Zealand College of Paramedicine, who actually helped me get here by paying registrations and so forth. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the drivers of innovation, which has been mentioned many times, so I won't spend too long on it. The models of the care, past, present and future, and then look at policy. I'm a bit of a policy nerd, so I'll try not to go for too long on that. So these are the drivers, improving clinical outcomes and that things like trauma and cardiac outcomes. We have been spectacularly successful. We've gone from when I worked as a paramedic on the road, our survival rate was practically nothing. And now we're talking about ROSC of over 50%. Our trauma systems work incredibly well. So we're really good at that. We're dealing with rising demand, and we've talked about that a lot over the last three or four days about demand and how to manage it. And we're really battling. The, seg the next thing is dealing with a stressed and underfunded health system. And I, we complain in Australia about our health system and that it's underfunded and we haven't got enough of this and that. And I listen to our American friends and their system that they have to deal with. It's not funding, it's actually it's so disjointed and fragmented. I don't know how you cope, guys. It's amazing. Um, and the other thing we're dealing with, which we don't talk about, is the changing values in society and the change in our profession, which has been driven by all those other factors, but we don't want to talk about it. We just go on blissfully as if nothing has changed. We've got the same structures and the same approaches to everything. And we're going to have to confront that. And it's a bit challenging. So before we start, I'll talk about models. I'm going to talk in model language. Now, models are not real. They're just representations. So when you see the models that I talk about, don't think that I'm saying this model exists somewhere. It might, but they're just representations. And you'll see familiar bits, and they'll overlap. So that's the first thing. So there's a few definitions. The one that at the bottom is probably the best about how a system works. That if you, I, I'm off a dairy farm, so that's why there's a cow. If you cut a cow in half, what do you get? A dead cow. Yes. You don't get two cows, do you? You can't divide it like a cell. So you've got to have a whole system. And paramedic systems work the same. You can't just cut it up into bits and expect to get a result. So that, I think, is the best definition of all. So the models of care. These are some definitions. And probably the bottom one's the most important. Our models of care are historically based. I would argue that 
the models we have in paramedicine today are not much different to what, we, what was created in the late 60s and early 70s. Places like Seattle, um, Dublin, Melbourne, where they first established intensive care programs, our models are pretty much based on that now. And I wasn't even in the ambulance service then. So it's a long time ago. We're talking about 40 to 50 years ago since we designed how we do things. And our dem demographics of our population have changed. We've changed. So what I'm going to discuss is four models. And these are theoretical models. They're not necessarily real, and they've changed a little bit over time. Firstly, there's the volunteer model. Secondly, what I call a sufficing or political model. And we're really good at that in Australia. It's a very political model. Um, unions um, say the world's going to end if they don't get resources, and management goes along with it because they can get resources. And I've been part of that process on both sides. The technolo technological models, which is really the intensive care model, and then practitioner models, and we'll come to that at the end. So here's the past models. This is the volunteer transport model. This is what was going on certainly in Australia in the 1950s. This was the model. And it was a voluntary model, no one was paid, and very closely connected to the community. And it was appreciated. And there was a sense of family. And this is a representation of that model. And I'm going to use this diagram to describe each of the models. And this one's pretty simple, isn't it? You start up there with the unplanned incident on the left top corner, and you follow the patient through. They ring a number. When I started in the ambulance service, we still had local numbers. One of the um, ambulance services that I went to as a manager, one of the numbers for one of the stations went to the local pub, literally. Everyone know what a pub is? I'm not using the wrong language. <laughs> OK. So, and they were absolutely resentful of me when I said, you can't ring the pub to get an ambulance, and we centralised the phones. That was the big modernisation that I did there. The place was called Patchawallock, and it's famous for a camel race. So, and you did everything locally, and you, deal, you dealt with a local doctor, if there was one, and you did basic life support. And all the decisions, the decision bits are really important. When you get to the later stages, you see there's a decision over there on the unplanned incident. That's the patient deciding, I'll rig an ambulance. Over here on the right, you've got the decision. And the decision is not in the pre-hospital or ambulance system. It's actually in the health system and probably made by the local doctor. So there's no decision making at all in that model. What we've got at present is a mixture. And that includes a volunteer model. I know there's someone, people from Western Australia, and they've got a massive volunteer system. I'm not saying your system is that previous system at all. It's modified quite a lot. And it's well and truly alive. There's thousands and thousands of volunteers in Australia and New Zealand. And I'm sure there's lots in other countries. And it is integrated. Certainly in our system, it's integrated into the system, they're part of the ambulance service, they're part of the health system. And it can include first responder programs, so it's not unsophisticated. The second model is what I call the sufficing model. And I haven't been able to come up with a better name, apart from saying it's very political. And this was, in Australia anyway, this was the model that was born out of strong unions and communities wanting more and we settled for what we could get. I've been a union rep, I've been on the management side as well, and we used to fight like hell on both sides, even when we agreed with each other. But the clear thing about this is about providing paramedic services is a public good. And we all identify with that, and we all have versions of this model. But it wasn't very advanced clinically. We could hardly do anything by today's standards. And it was dominated by the clock. That's why there's a clock there. Response times are the big thing. And they seem to mean something at the time. I'm partly to blame for the response time standards in Australia. Um, to my 
regret, to be honest. Um, but that's the way it was done at the time. And this is the model here. And it's slightly different. You see, there's a lot more decision points. We have dispatch. We had control of dispatch. It was all centralised. We decided whether there'd be people would be transported or not and where they'd be transported to. So that's where the decisions are made. And from a paramedic's point of view, particularly middle manager, that's really good because you get control. So we had almost total control ourselves and we get pretty difficult to deal with. But things like research, it's over in the health system. We didn't do any research. That was done by the doctors and other people, but not us. Now, this is the technological model. This is the intensive care model, if you like. And we've all got that. And it's about technology. It's about interventions. It's about zapping people and sticking needles in and giving drugs. And it's totally different. But we've been fantastically successful at what we set out to do. Unfortunately, the patient mix has changed. And down in the left-hand corner is a bit of an elephant in the room. Who knows about the Franco-German model? Many of you? Who doesn't know about it? Never heard of it? Right. We could have a whole lecture on that. But the Franco-German model is, we, we work in the Anglo-American model of paramedicine, to, which we're all familiar with. The Frank, Franco-German model is a European model, and it's quite different. Ambulance, who, who do you think staffs ambulances? Doctors and nurses. Yeah, someone can read. So it's doctors and nurses. But we're not going to discuss that today. But go away and think about it and see how it would change things. So that's where we are at the moment. Now, we'll look at that model on my little diagram, and it's different. Look what's happened. The decisions are all over the place, aren't they? You've still got the patient making decisions, or the public. You've still got the paramedic system making decisions. And we've introduced medical direction because it's so technological. And you've still got clinical research, but it's still in the medical realm. We still haven't got control of that side of things. And we've actually handed control to somebody else. So that's the technological model. And I could talk for a long time and criticise it because it's really has limitations and I'm not sure it's got a great future. I'm not saying we won't use technology, we will. But this is the emerging model. This is what I actually want to talk about. And this is what community paramedicine fits into. And the, the definitions are interesting. It's about a range of services and to prevent injury and illness. To get in first, get at the top of the cliff, not the bottom of the cliff and still respond to emergencies, but result in a healthy community. Isn't that community paramedicine? I think it is. The other main thing is the value statement. It's actually part of the health system, not separate. And we spent years being separate. I remember putting an ambulance station into a hospital when I was a senior manager, and you would have thought the world was going to end. You can't have an ambulance station in the hospital. What would we do all day? They'll drive us crazy. They were not happy about it, but it happened. It's got two versions. Um, there's community paramedicine, which we're talking about here. There's also a version, the extended care paramedic, which Matt spoke about from New South Wales. So it's a different name, but let's not get too worried about that. But it's about being a paramedic practitioner. And uh, the part that Mary spoke about earlier, about the practitioner model, that's this. It's the same thing. Now, my little diagram is quite different. It's very different. What we've done is we moved all of the decision making, apart from the patient, of course, across back to us. There's no medical direction. I actually disagree with what was said before on that point. There's no evidence for medical direction. There's evidence for good governance and good evidence of good care. 
And if we have good governance, we can do things. What this does, it shifts it back to us. It also moves the research back to us, so we do our own research. It's not to say we don't take notice of other research or work with other researchers, far from it. But we're doing our own thing. And on the very bottom is professional self-regulation. And that's what replaces medical direction. Now that's a bit of a challenge, particularly to people in the States and to the medical profession for that matter. But there's a whole loop there and there's a whole lot of referral points, and that's where the decisions are made. And we're trying to reduce that pressure on EDs. We're trying to keep people at home. Now, this diagram was done 15 years ago. So we're pretty slow sometimes. Now, another way to look at it is use what they call a rich picture. I could have done this for each of the models, but we'd be talking for too long. And what it does, it, talk, it breaks it up into different parts of a model. So you've got the people who actually do the job, you've got the patients, and you've got other actors involved, the hospitals and the medical uh, staff and research and the general philosophy. But it's based around teamwork and integration and having autonomy as a profession. So this is the practitioner model, but it moves around. It, it's not set in concrete. And you can see all the activities on the side about what to do. And people have been talking about this for the last two days, all this stuff. So I'm not going to repeat it. So there's a few implications of this sort of model. You need to think about this because this is going to happen to you. If you're going through and setting up paramedic program or community paramedic pro programs, you're going to have to confront some of these issues. You're going to expand the roles. You're doing that already. One of the criticisms I, I guess I've got of the technological model is that we see some of our problem patients as someone else's problem. If someone calls for an ambulance, what's someone say? two or three times a day? Are they someone else's problem or our problem? We'd like to think they were someone else's problem, but they're not. They're our problem. They're ringing us. So we have to deal with that and not ignore it. It's no good saying we'll just fluff them off and you know, we'll do telephone triage and we'll get rid of them all. It doesn't quite work that way. We need to have a more patient-centered approach. And there's a really good report in British Columbia looking at community paramedicine programs that actually spends a lot of time looking at the need to have a patient-centered approach. And that's not something that comes to us naturally. Paramedics are pretty bossy. And we like to have control. This is saying the patients want some control. So we have to listen to them. And the other is community engagement. And I'd have to say that the smaller ambulance services in the US and Ontario, for instance, much better at this than us. We have massive ambulance services in Australia and, and also in England, where we have a whole state with a workforce of three, 4,000 paramedics, big organisations, lots of, organ lots of systems in place. But what do we do at our stations? We lock the doors until we get a call. It's shocking, really. So we don't have that connection with the community. So don't lose that. And of course, there's the changing scopes of practice and less protocol driven, much more autonomous, much more accountable too. The need for teamwork, and certainly the research I did a few years ago indicated that paramedics aren't that good at teamwork. We don't value it in the same way that other professions do, like nursing. Nursing's much better at teamwork than us. So we need to learn to work in teams and not be in a silo. And I've already mentioned about self-regulation, that self-regulation will come, it has to come. If we want autonomy, we need self-regulation. And this has also been mentioned about the need for lifelong learning. As professionals, we can't expect to do our course, whether it's a certificate course or a degree course or a diploma or whatever it is, and just stop. Continuing education is going to be part of it because 
the technology is changing so much. So, does this ring a, a bell with you? Does this actually make any sense to you? I see a few nods. So hopefully it does and might give you a framework to work around. And that's all it's for. It's a theoretical framework for you to work off and say, actually what we're doing is sort of like that, but we're a little bit different and that's okay. It's not about being terribly prescriptive. So you use the models to set your objectives, develop some KPIs, and that's really important. And then look at the implications for paramedic education and so forth, and regulation. Like tomorrow we're having a whole day. How many are coming tomorrow for the education day? A few of you. Okay. So this has got implications for paramedic education because if we're going to have a profession that is at a practitioner level, we're going to need an education that teaches us more than protocols. You need to have a knowledge base and have decision making skills, as well as that teamwork and communication. And you can read all about it if you like. There's lots of that. So Thank you, that's all I have to say really. Um, for those who don't know, the, the little animal up on the top right hand corner is called a platypus. And I, I'd like using this to explain what community paramedicine is. Because platypus is an egg laying mammal. So it's a mammal, like a, you know, a horse, but it lays eggs. And it's got a bill like a duck, and it's got feet like a duck, but it also has a venomous sting. So you wouldn't even try and invent that, would you? <laughs> you couldn't possibly think of it that way. And I think community paramedicine is a bit of a platypus. It has got a scientific name and I can't pronounce it. <laughs>